Here's a bulletin of the United States Green Associate, uh, Green Section of the United States Golf Association in 1921. I love reading these old articles. <laughs> okay, and this particular one uh, has a par- couple paragraphs that I'm going to read, and in the title is it's by Piper and Oakley on page 43 of this particular bulletin, and it says the use and abuse of lime. Okay, so we're all familiar with oh, you got to lime your soil. You got to lime it, and a lot of a lot of operations will have that built in every year. Oh, I'm gonna do a lime application. I'm gonna do a lime application in the first of March or first of May or whatever the case is. I'm gonna put out you know 100 pounds of lime. You know, it's the same thing every year. Okay, and my argument is, well, it's not an argument, but my question is, how do you know you need it? I mean, it's not, it's not. Uh, I'm not being facetious. I mean, how do you know you need it? Because there's many, many cases where just leaving it alone might be the best thing. Liming it might actually cause more problems. And the USGA said this, there is still room for difference in opinion regarding the desirability of using lime on golf courses. But the weight of the present evidence is that as good or better results are secured without lime as by its use, certainly so in the case of bents, fescues, and probably so in the case of most other turf grasses. The vast amount of agricultural literature dealing with the use of lime and some enticing rhetorical statements such as lime sweetens the soil have conspired to lead many people to believe that lime is, a correct, is corrective for all the ills of soil and of turf. It is this belief that leads many misguided victims to scatter lime on their half bare lawns every spring with the simple faith that this will in some way ensure a dense cover of green velvet sward. Year after year, they do the same thing with exactly the same results as if they had not used the lime. A coarse lawn of crabgrass in summer and a cover of ghastly gray-brown dead turf in winter, but their faith never seems to weaken, and indeed against such faith no reason can prevail. I mean, that's pretty strong language. And the USGA back in the 20s and 30s used to write more stuff like this. And I wish they would do more of it where they have sound evidence and they make firm conclusions on it. And what they're saying is, is that people just go out blindly and applying a lime because they've just always done it. Or they did it on this lawn and they saw a response. So they're just going to do it on every lawn or they're going to do it. They did it on this fairway. And they swear they saw a response, so they're just going to do it on every fairway. When in reality, there, <laughs> there's, there, there are cases where that's needed, but there's many, many cases where it's not needed. And there's some cases where doing so might actually harm your turf. So the question is, how do you know you need to do it? Okay. I'm talking agriculture. I'm not talking business right now. I'm talking the agricultural value and the science behind applying lime. How do you know you actually need to apply that? And if you're going to use soil solubility of nutrients as a reason, that's a bad reason. That's a really bad reason. Okay. Because you're not accounting for the plant interaction with the nutrients when you do that. What is a good reason is what I put up there just a minute ago. That, that chart, by this, this, this figure by Dr. Gertal. That's a damn good reason to go out and apply lime. If you got your pH of four and your turf's looking like this, <laughs> that, that's a really good reason. Okay, but not because all oh, nutrients, um, a pH 5.5, I need to be at 6.5 to have more nutrients available at 6.5. That's a bad reason. Okay, this is a good reason. Thank you, Beth. Appreciate your, your efforts. 